Well, welcome everyone. My name is Angela. I work for the Town of Amherst. This meeting is being recorded to the cloud and will be uploaded to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel shortly by our wonderful IT staff. And at this point, I'd like to turn things over to the chair, Jim Pistring. Hi, folks. This is Jim Pistring. I am the current chair of the Resident Advisory Committee. And just before we... And always may you be so. <laughs> we'll see about that. And before we call the meeting to order, just a reminder that pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are meeting via remote participation and that um, order has been extended and so we're still meeting remotely as per that extension. Um, I just want to make sure um, and it can just be a show of hands if everybody could wave and confirm on the panelist side that their video and audio is working properly. Just give me a thumbs up. Good. Okay. Um, Angela's already reminded us that this meeting is being recorded to the web. So I will now call the meeting to order. And that was indeed the first item of the agenda. Maybe so we do have somebody in the gallery. Can they see us or can they just hear us? Um, it, de it depends how they've logged in. If they're on okay. the phone, they can hear us. If they're on a computer, they can see us and hear us. Why don't I quickly go around and call on people to introduce themselves and what they're doing here. So again, I'm Jim Pistering, the chair, and Anastasia. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, Anastasia Ordonez, and I'm a member of the Resident Advisory Committee and uh, Amherst resident. Okay, and Meg? I'm Meg Gage. I live in North Amherst. I'm a member of the Resident Advisory Committee. And Jennifer? Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Moyston. I am a community participation officer as well as the assistant director to the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. Great. So the first thing on our agenda is to review, if necessary, and approve the minutes from our February 22nd meeting. And including those minutes was how we were going to invite community participation officers to come to this meeting. So that explains why Jennifer is here. So did anybody have any comments or questions or anything regarding the February 22nd draft minutes. I don't see anybody jumping up and down and waving. So in that case, I would like to make a motion that we approve the minutes from February 22nd. And all those in favor can just give me a thumbs up and I'll report on the results. And the results are all three members voted in favor of approving the minutes. So they are approved. So I'll ask, so if Angela, if you could, hang on a second, I'll come in a second. Sure. So Angela, if you could change them, get rid of that little draft thing and post them, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. and Meg, did you have a comment? A question, um, since there's only one member just do, in the audience, do we know who that is? Or uh, it doesn't, I guess we don't um, need to know, but they all know us. <laughs> sure, so the name um, that's coming up for me is Alana Bailey. Yeah, yeah, you can actually see it in participants on your Zoom. So hi, Alana, okay. if you're really there. Um, and there will be a time later for public comment if you want to make public comment. Next on our agenda, we was to have a discussion of volunteer recruiting practices. Um, and that was just sort of a continuation. We talked about that at our last meeting, and I don't know for sure that there's more to discuss. I don't know if anybody has more to discuss about that. Yes, Meg. I just like to say, because we have Jennifer here, uh, uh, and I, I appreciate all the the, the uh, three uh, community participate community participation officers do. Um, and I, I think this is something I said at the last meeting, but Jen wasn't there. I think we need to increasingly look for ways to structure a pipeline or a leadership pipeline. So it isn't only individuals going out to groups and personally asking this person and that one, but to try to think, are there any creative ways that we could make those things happen more in a more uh, structured way? Uh, whatever you thought of town meeting, it was a pipeline, a leadership pipeline because if you showed up at all, 
you learned about how the budget works, what the different committees were and so on. I don't know if, I don't think anybody would attend a, uh, you know, a little mini course on how the town works. I, I don't know who would go to that, but uh, I just think we can't get, there. we can't be too, there's no way to be too creative in figuring that out. That said, I think we're doing, having been on these interviews, we're doing a really good job of getting more diverse candidates. We've had diverse candidates for every position mm -hmm. and Paul values that and has, you know, taken advantage of that in his appointments. So I'm not saying we're doing a bad job, but I just think the more we can set up systems rather than counting on you three individuals to make every contact or, uh, although that's wonderful and important. And I know a lot of us do that as well, reach out. You know, I had some people over for dinner the other night just for the purpose of finding out when, where they might want to plug in. But, you know, things like that, inviting people over for dinner and, uh, had Michelle was here too, talked about reparations and I think, you know, all the ways that a young uh, black person can plug in in Amherst in a, in a positive way, because people don't feel, don't see a welcome sign or a welcome mat necessarily, especially young people who are busy. Um, so I just say it again, I think we can't do too much in this area to find people who, who don't find us. Sorry so, for the little speech. Yeah. <laughs> That's so my thing. I'd, That's why I'd, I got on this committee. <laughs> this is a, a great segue to maybe go out of order and come back to discussing the renaming of the CAF and go right into discussion of community participation officer activities. You know, maybe hear from right. Angela and Jennifer, you know, what, what do you guys do? And, you know, what are you up to? Yeah. So go for it, one of you. Then do you want to start or do you want us to use the PowerPoint that we've Put into the packet and, and roll from there. Yeah, I think PowerPoint. we can use the PowerPoint and then kind of um, ad lib in or add to afterwards. Great. Okay. So I'm running this as a PDF. Let's see if I can do this. Here we go. Thanks for doing that. Gosh. Sure. So we put this together for. Um, one of our other meetings, and it kind of gives a very specific overview of where the CPO is created in the Home Rule Charter, which is the document that created our change of government. So when um, when we made the government switch, Paul decided to make three of us community participation officers, Jennifer Moiston, Brianna Sunred, and myself. And it was kind of a genius move because all three of us have kids who are in the school system or have gone through the school system. And then all three of us are um, volunteering in the community in lots of different ways. So this is the specific language on this first slide. Am I okay to advance? Yeah. Yeah. So these are Aww. your three CPO officers. <laughs> And um, lots of us have experience in other languages. And um, and so we all, um, Jennifer grew up in town. Brianna has lived in town for a long time. I've lived in town since 91. Um, and we all have attended different um, faith communities in, in addition to the public school experiences. So these are the things that we as a team bring to the work. Great. And then these are just kind of an overview or a sampling of the things that were involved in planning, but also um, some of the events that we've kind of brainstormed together that we feel celebrate our community in different ways. And so just to highlight like the Cup of Joes with Paul, those are great opportunities for us. They're really great to meet people who are activated in some form or another that it, it forces them to leave the house and come and meet with Paul. And at those at those kind of gatherings, we're able to take people aside one-to-one -one and say, you know, I noticed you're really interested in, I don't know, electric buses. Why don't, why don't you and I have a conversation about 
the Energy and Climate Action Committee? Or why don't the two of us have a conversation about, you know, getting involved or looking at school committee? Or there are lots of different ways to kind of take people aside at those type of events, which has worked for us in the past. But um, Cup of Joe's with Paul are usually like once every two or three months and a little bit more often when the weather's nicer. So we the also town manager. Sorry, is, are the town manager office hours open on the website, or I've never known about that. Um, so that was something new during the pandemic. We did them via Zoom, mm -hmm. and then when we've done them in person, it's kind of been an extension of the coffee hour, or in addition to the coffee hour. And they do go on the they go on the community calendar. Mm -hmm. Um, Anastasia has her hand raised. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I was just curious, Angela, uh, you said that they, the, the Cup of Joes, or is that what they call them, Cup of Joes, uh -huh. uh, are met, are, are done every two or three months. How many people on average usually show up to these? So many times it depends on what the hot, hot topics are at the moment. Um, right now, like the most recent ones have been very elementary school building focused. And so it's been an opportunity to ask questions about the cost and how it will be funded and the two and a half percent override vote or debt exclusion vote. Um, and so in the like during the pandemic, obviously, many of the questions were about pandemic restrictions, but um, it has varied from like two to three people to, I would say, pre-pandemic, the one the ones that I attended had 15 to 20 people. That's great. Okay, but thank you. The, the school one that I went to a couple of weeks ago had like thirty people mm -hmm. at wow. least, and the media were there, and uh, at least thirty people were there. It was very good. Mm -hmm. There have Kathy been. I Shane, know Kathy Shane was there, who was leading with Paul the discussion. Sorry, mm -hmm. Jen. No, that's okay. I was just going to say it really does depend on which, um, who what the hot topic is because I know like when Chris when Earl was introduced and he was at a cup of joe that gathered like mm -hmm. 40 people mm -hmm. right and yeah. so um it just really does vary so these are kind of an overview of the recent events and places where CPOs could have been found or were activated and then um this has mostly moved a lot of this is coming out of our DEI office. So thank you, Jennifer. But um, these are a lot of the cultural events and flag raisings that happen throughout the year. And people always ask why we're taking pictures of the back of children's heads. And I just want to say, you know, now that we're on the record, have to. it's the safe way to do it. <laughs> right. And they're Absolutely. still just as cute. <laughs> So looking ahead, we um, meet as a CPO team, not too often, but every now and again to talk about challenges and limitations. Um, we are trying to connect with more community partners and we have discussed and are starting to outline goals and plans for the future. So it's an interesting time in local government and with the change of um, government, we've seen lots of and and I would say due to the pandemic, we've seen lots of people value their time differently. So it's interesting. Some of the CAFs that come in, the community activity forms are incredibly detailed about exactly how people yeah. want to use mm -hmm. their talents and want their time to be utilized. So it's um it's an it's a great time to be in local government. So our future goals, I think, are shared by the members of the residents advisory committee. We definitely are working to expand, expand language access to meetings like this one and to other meetings, um, redefine the scope of our work, and we're always looking for new ways to measure success and um, invite people to learn more about local government. And we have Brianna's plan as part of this, this meeting packet for Government 101. So what's next? We continue to build community pride through our good works. We try and collaborate as often as we can with um, the regional public schools. And we love to work with the bid in the chamber. And um, the ambassadors were something that we sun sunset in December. They were our public education response or feet on boots on the ground during the pandemic. And then we're always seeking to redefine what it means to have 
a good kind of community sense of stewardship. Great. Thanks. That's us. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. So do you want to give us an overview of what this Amherst Civic Academy thing is? In a nutshell, it is um, a several week to week, like a, a six to eight week program that we would put together. We were hoping to um, include people who had gone through the Center for New Americans, but also people who are new to town. And so we would reach out through realtors and through other organizations to try and find newbies to town and to invite them to learn more about the town that they've just moved into. Um, and it would include things like um, field trips to the DPW, field trips to the wastewater treatment plant, field trips to conservation areas, um, an overview of all the different departments, where the money is spent, how the money is spent, why the money is spent, the way the money is spent, and then also insights into the structure of government, right? So. Um, sitting through a recording of a council meeting and looking at all the different sections of the agenda and why they're there and and the function of that legislative branch of the government and then obviously um an overview of the executive branch and the chief financial officer and that would be paul's office so definitely a deep dive into hmm. how local taxes are used and then also the role of advisory boards, committees, and commissions, and using that as an entree point for people into local government. Hmm. And has this been published yet, or is this still just in the planning stages? It has been, the skeleton of it has been in the works, and the three of us have kind of offered our, our input. It's Brianna's brainstorm, and, mm -hmm. um, and she looked around at best practices and what other communities were doing for this um, civic education program. I think one of the things that we've talked about expanding maybe is looking at the role of the counselors and how to instruct people on running for council in a more specific way. I think there's this nebulous zone of like, oh, you know, I would I'd love to be a town counselor. And then and then there are all these steps, right? Like how do I activate a funding source and how do I make sure I meet all the bench benchmarks and deadlines for reporting and how do I get my name on the ballot, right? So that should be a very uh, critical piece of the puzzle for mm -hmm. this program that we haven't completely fleshed out yet. Meg, yeah, Meg. Go ahead. Um, related to that, uh, I think that's a great idea to give the counselors some tips on how they could engage people when they have their sessions uh, or even not every district has a neighborhood association, but even so you can have a district meeting and use those as a time to tell people uh, what's going on. So for example, Kathy told us about the uh, resident capital requests. And I don't think, I don't know if we're gonna get any of them, but we applied for four and actually two others. Uh, and they were all reinforcing one concept of making uh, pedestrian and bicycle safer in North Amherst, but somebody I said, brought up at the JCPC, how come they had, they had so many from North Amherst? We didn't have any from South Amherst. And she said, well, did you tell them about it? <laughs> right. And no one, no one had told uh, anybody that there was this opportunity, whether, again, whether they're actually, in, I mean, part of this, you know, I, you know, I'm into this uh, participatory budgeting and giving people a way to have an influence on the budget, uh, which didn't go anywhere. But um, if th this was a, you shouldn't give people a chance to apply for funding if there isn't any intention of funding anything. But the CPA, for example, uh, a huge, huge portion of the CPA applications come from the town. Mm -hmm. And if it's really intended for com the community, uh, the counselors could do a better job of letting their constituents know when these deadlines are approaching or dealing ahead. So that's a great idea to train the counselors to just think, you know, Although that's I don't why think... we have two, that's why we have two district counselors rather than one, because on the charter commission, we thought it was so important that there be, a, you know, as much local control over the council as possible. 
Yeah. Well, while I agree with you, I don't think training the counselors is anywhere in this civic academy plan. This is talking about sort of normal yeah. citizens and teaching them. I was um, just referring to what Angela had said. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry, off the topic. <laughs> No, but this thing, you know, it. it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, obviously you need to figure out great strategies to publicize it. And, you know, eight, two hour sessions where you watch videos of town council meetings, you know, you're going to have to work hard to get people. You have to keep it lively and keep it fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> it'll be interesting to see if you can, you know, sell it to people and get people to be involved. Yeah. Anastasia, sorry, go ahead. No, it's good. Um, I'm trying to figure out if the digital hand or the actual hand is better. I think the actual hand might be getting better. Yeah, with five of us, actually. <laughs> the digital hand kind of gets lost in the background. Uh, so I, I really appreciate hearing about all of this, and I look forward to the plan being further fleshed out. I'm especially excited, actually, about the partnership or potential partnership with the bid, because I actually see that you know the pipeline that Meg was talking about to civic engagement can often start with employers. And having, you know, employers in town, businesses in town provide an incentive, right, to employees to get curious about how their town works, to, you know, get engaged, to volunteer on committees or do different things would be a fantastic opportunity to expand the number of people that might maybe become passionate mm -hmm. about, it, right? Like all of us here have served in some capacity, you know, at a town government level. And uh, you, that happens, it doesn't happen organically, it usually happens because you sort of, you know, notice something, somebody comes to you and says, hey, would you be interested in doing this? But if you have this kind of more formal pipeline created through, you know, employers in town who are basically saying, I'm going to donate a number of hours to the town through my employees to have a volunteer day, right, and learn about how the, the community functions, learn about how our local government functions, I would see that as a great opportunity to get more people excited and interested mm -hmm. in what's going on. So I do look forward to seeing a fleshed out plan um, and you know, would love to continue to hear more about that as that develops. And I think the fact that it's a six to eight week program also gives a chance for people to, you know, to Oops. substantively learn something as opposed to just diving in quickly and then leaving. Mm -hmm. I agree. Good luck with it. Is there, I, I was just trying to find, did we get a description of the Civic Academy that I can't mm -hmm. find? Oh, it's in the okay. packet right after the PowerPoint thing. Okay. So I'll if you it. just keep scrolling down and it, it's kind of tiny, but if, in a browser, if you just hit command or yeah, okay. control plus, it gets bigger and you can read yeah, it. I didn't want to distract myself. Yeah. If there's any way ever, sorry, raise your hand. Go ahead. Is there any way we can help you guys in any way? Or if you want to brainstorm things, or I don't know, just if we can be supportive of what you're doing, it's really what great what you're doing, and um, or if you, if you can think of other ways people could be helpful to you, let us know. So I think part of the thing that um, we've been really pleasantly surprised by is the um, the outreach from some of the student teachers at the middle school this past year. They are doing a whole segment on local government. And so oh, nice. Paul was invited to do um, a short video, kind of like a, oh. this is your town introduction piece and I am your town manager <laughs> and this is what it means. And surprise, Amherst doesn't have a mayor. Um, and, and so that really uh, focused our efforts on the Civic Academy and made us realize, you know, if we could hook them while they're young, that might not be such a bad thing. And um, the resurgence of like civic pride through organizations <laughs> like the Sunrise Group, um, those kids have been doing some really interesting environmental um, pieces of the puzzle. So it's um, it's a great time, I think, to kind of look at how to activate different age groups and get people better involved. Nice. Nice, yeah. And I guess I would just add to that that um, first, there are some middle schoolers who usually typically participate in like the MLK reading that we have here with the town. Um, so, and the Human Rights Commission has two high school students on it now. And so we typically have high school students yeah. and they're graduating. So they're looking for, um, you know, the next two folks to come sit on the board as well. And, you know, part of the, in, 
becoming more diverse or more inclusive, I just think is there's a lot to it because from my perspective, there's a lot of barriers, but we don't necessarily know what all of those barriers are, right? And so it comes down to childcare, dinner, um, I will say that since we've gone via Zoom, right, participation is has increased, at least for at least at the HRC level. Like we usually never had anybody. Now we have a pretty good group of people who are who are watching online because they can be cooking dinner at the same time while listening to the meeting. So hopefully the state government will give us some kind of way to move forward with a hybrid um version of of meetings moving forward. And then I just, I really spend a lot of time thinking about alternative ways to get the folks that we don't usually see here in local government involved. And one of the things that I had to come to realize is that not everybody wants to be on the finance committee, right? Like it's just something that not everybody wants to do. And oh, so how do how we is get that the, possible? <laughs> how do we get people still to be engaged with local government, even if they're not going to be sitting on a board or committee? Or how do we just make them aware that, you know, I think about before I was involved with local government, and local government's one of those things where if you're not tapped in yourself or not with in a group of people who are tapped in, you're not, you don't necessarily know. And so um, it's how do we just keep everybody just kind of aware of the different things that are happening in town and, and you know, a lot of folks don't know there's a human rights commission, a lot of folks don't know that there's even a finance committee or that their voice, they can go to a meeting and voice their opinion on stuff. And so it's really about how do we connect to those voices as, as well. And so, um, and then what do you do if they don't want to sit on a board or committee and how do we get them involved? So just. It, you know, one thing yeah, you I, could promote, which would have multiple benefits, is a lot of people don't know that they can work off part of their property tax by doing things like taking minutes at meetings, uh, being a, you know, welcoming people at the senior center, stacking books in the library. But uh, when you take minutes at a meeting, you find out what's going on. And um, you also work off... Uh, some of your taxes, which I think we should be promoting anyway, as a well, we're while so many people are worried about the cost of the over, the debt exclusion override. Um, yeah, we have a really the, great senior tax workoff program uh -huh. um, currently now, and so I don't know if there's a cap to the amount of people that can be involved in that or not, but that is one way that we we do, you know, and I know that the whole concept of of um, stipends has been going around for a long time and how to get people involved. And there's always that question of civic duty versus like money, but then you have to worry if about whether or not it's a barrier or not, right? Because I think about the times when I was raising my kids and not in local government, I was working two jobs with three kids there. I just didn't have the time to think about local government really. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Where that you are now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just, I, you know, I just think that diversifying our boards and staff and becoming a welcome, welcoming community is is just this really big pie, right? Like, and there's multiple layers to it or cake, right? Because that would work better, layered cake. Right. Um, so it's there's just and there's no wrong way necessarily, and there's mul because there's multiple ways to to get it accomplished. Um, I'm going to loop back in the agenda and we had talked about the pros and cons. I don't know that we can decide this. We can't decide this, but of renaming the CAF from the community activity form, which I think it is now to the community participation form. So CAF to CPF. Um, I don't know, anybody want to comment on that thought? Yeah, Meg. Um, seems like I'm talking too much, but this I think this was originated with me. Uh, the word activity to me doesn't communicate what we're talking about. It sounds like, you know, knitting or uh, I don't know, uh, hobbies, activities to me isn't what we're talking about is really specific participation. And so the word participation, especially the, we use that word community participation officers. Uh, it just seems the word 
is more appropriate. Um, I'm not sure activity form is a turns people off. It's just it, the word participation is to me a better word. I've been trying to think of ways of using the word participation that end in an acronym that you can say, like participation application form, which would be PATH. Uh, but it, we could figure some way for there to be an acronym that you can say. But uh, it, again, this isn't the most important thing we have to do, but it's always struck me as the wrong word. Although yeah. we've used it forever and ever. Yeah. And there is the point, one of the advantages is half, you know, we've got a nice acronym that we say right. all the time. But. <laughs> but we could have another, we could have yeah. half or we could work. I know that's, that's the benefit of activity. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there have been changes in the form itself over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and who generally drives that? How do changes occur? We just just by magic. Um, it's <laughs> been it's been the residence advisory committee. Yeah. Um, and we did a major overhaul with the first rack members, mm -hmm. and it was kind of um, in response to feedback that we had from the public that we were being too intrusive with the questions, like who really needed to know if you owned a house or rented, and who yeah. really needed to know um, your exact age or. You know, why couldn't some of this be more um, self-selective, right? So mm -hmm. now, really, the only things we ask for are a name, an address in town where the person resides as their primary residence, and a method of communication, either a phone number and or an email address. And everything else, race, gender, pronouns, everything else is self-submit. It's challenged by choice. And I, I think that that group was very conscious, too, from switching it, because if I'm not mistaken, it was RAF before, so it was resident activity form or something similar to mm -hmm. that. Um, and so it was switched to community members instead of residents. And I think that the CPO yes. uh -huh. kind of took that on and stopped using the word resident and you start using the word community members as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we did do it. The art, the RAC committee did a survey our first year of feedback on the um, on the half process and the interview process, and that's where a lot of this stuff came from. Um, it was an interesting survey, and you know, it did lead us to having a more generic form and just the sense of the survey of people not wanting to be an intrusive and wanted to be an easy and somewhat anonymous path to at least the first dipping your toe into possibly being a volunteer. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna jump in. Jump, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna chair myself, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you will um, be another one soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually think it's a no brainer, you know, having community participation form makes a whole lot of sense for all the reasons that have been stated previously. And I'm, I'm deeply in favor of changing that. I also just want to say that, you know, I, I, uh, so I, I'm a part of an organization that works on racial equity and, you know, one of the conversations that we have been having as an organization recently is about data and data collection. And, you know, there is actually a lot to be said about collecting demographic information, right? And it should be voluntary. It should not be forced on people. But at the same time, if we actually want to be able to make change and we want to live to our values, we have to be able to show that we're making some progress. Or if we're not, then we have to be able to show that too and have that transparency with the community to say, like, you know, we're getting the kinds of, you know, we're getting diverse representation of all kinds in our committees or we're not. And then what do we do to improve that? Right. So I, you know, maybe it's also thinking about the form a little bit outside the box or outside of the form, so to speak, you know, is it the instructions that we give folks, right? So we can say, you know, none of this information is required, but it is helpful in order for us to be able to track our progress and to be able to further engage, you know, uh, underrepresented groups. 
So there are things that maybe we, we could be doing a little differently with our form mm -hmm. that would encourage that kind of participation. Mm -hmm. I do I do believe that we have to you know lower or reduce the barriers of entry for sure, and we certainly mm -hmm. don't want to you know uh, reduce people's enthusiasm for participating. But we have one certain type of person that repeatedly volunteers in this town for everything, and beyond oh. that, we don't <laughs> get diversity of voice. You know. Um, so that's been true for, for years now, you know, so we always get the same kinds of folks that are always repeatedly, you know, engaged and, and constantly out there. And we certainly want them to continue to be engaged, but we also want more people uh, of different kinds with different voices mm -hmm. involved in that. So I think, I think, you know, the, the CPF, uh, an acronym, I don't, I don't care so much about that. We'll call it the CPF. So can I, um, jump in here, Jim, is that okay? Absolutely. So in preparation for this agenda item, I had a longer conversation with Brianna Sunred, who runs our website. And the CAF is cross-posted in over 180 places on the website, which will make switching the moniker for this form pretty difficult. Because when we switch the name, we can't just swap it out in all those 180 places. Um, I, I think one of the things we talked about was maybe doing a better uh, introduction of what the CAF is and saying maybe in a short video to people like, thank you for wanting to get involved in local government. We welcome you as a resident to apply for all these different boards and committees. We are looking for you know more diversity on all of our boards and committees. We're looking for our boards and committees to look a lot more like our community looks. And so we want you to participate via this form it should be called the community participation form but we call it the caf <laughs> yes yeah meg is is there a volunteer i mean if you could do one a minute it would be three hours is there some kind of i mean i would do it if i knew had lots of time and knew how to do it but who could go through and just change those all well or is there I'm... a way to go find find and change there there is a way to go find i think the more specific piece, as it was explained to me, is that they link back to the original form. And what's important for all of you to know, because it's all behind the scenes, is that original form feeds into a database as part of Civic Plus, which is the program that runs mm -hmm. for our town, runs our website. In addition to that, there is a busy bee in our office who for years has downloaded that form and then fed that information into an access database, which goes all the way back to the early 1990s. So if, but what if it was a change that was really horrific can, and just had to be changed? So Meg, yeah, let, let me address oh, your question. Excuse me. Let me yeah. address your question because I'm, I'm pretty somewhat knowledgeable about um, Civic Plus and how it all works. And I think the answer is if this was some pretty egregious thing, if it had some really horrible, insulting name, it would be changed and somebody would be tasked with it and it wouldn't be insurmountable, wouldn't be a month of their time. It probably wouldn't even be a week of their time, but it might be a couple of days of their time. And setting something up so a volunteer could do it would probably double the amount of time. So it's not something, right. you know, and, you know, if it was a system that was an amazing relational database where the name was in one place and one place only, like the systems I designed, for example, um, it would be easy, but even then it's, it's not easy. It's, it's something that just, it's, it's a tricky thing that would take a certain amount of time. And I think you have to weigh the importance of it versus the amount of time. And if, you know, there's a groundswell from us, from Angela, from Jennifer that says, you know, this name is really insulting. We need a different name. Then I feel pretty confident it could be done. But if it's, if it feels like more of a cosmetic thing, then it's probably not worth that effort. And if it's something in between, you have to make a judgment over all the other things that the tech people have to do and Brianna has to do. So I think that's where they're coming from. So if we decide not to do this, we should in our minutes be clear that we think it's a good idea I'm not sure this is where we've gone, but it sounds like this is where we're headed. Yeah, I mean, definitely. This is a good idea, but the technology didn't warrant it at this time. 
I, I'd say I still think it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, and I think you and uh, Anastasia both have said yes, it's a good idea. I'm I'm a little more ambivalent. I guess I don't I don't think that the current name is driving people away, or a new name would get more people. And I think it's all that other stuff we talk about that makes more of a difference. But yes, we can definitely reflect in the minutes that the two of you think it's a good idea. And you know, maybe Angela wants to say that she thinks it's a good idea too. But whether it's worth it or not is the other question. From a, from a staff standpoint, I think there are ways that we could make that that welcome mat a little bit more inviting. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I've looked at that page and I look at it several times a day because of the nature of my work. And I feel like it is a perfect spot to have a more kind of upbeat and welcoming five minute video in three different languages like welcome this is your town and we're so happy that you've landed on this page and this is mm -hmm. a great space for you to kind of dip your feet in the water and below us like on this page are all the different boards and committees and commissions and so let us walk you through how to apply yeah and, and something like that right. would be easy to do because you just have to put a link in one place to right. go to this new place that shows you all that stuff right yep you can also maybe have some little vignettes of people who are serving on different committees saying, you know, I'm so-and-so yeah, and, -so, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. I'm on the such and shade tree committee and some, or, you know, different committees. People joke about all the committees, but it is the way to get people involved. So, so it's good. We have so many committees. Yeah. You know, there's 47, I'll just say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, too, I think part of it is, is that, oh, Ange, can you unmute? Sorry, I'm echoing, I, at least I hear it. Okay, thanks. So again, I think part of it too is like, how, how do we get those people to go to the website, right? Like we still have to mm -hmm. find those people. And so it's like, what are the different things? And I think that the CPOs, we do a great job and the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion do a great job of trying to get out into the world, you know, like we've kind of gotten rid of that concept of thinking that everybody was going to come to us because we see where that gets us, but actually going out to the other, you know, um, already existing things that are going on in town is also like a great way. And then mm -hmm. also, you know, I would say like this year, the um, HRC and the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, we're having like a a basketball tournament and that's gonna it's like something that's been happening in the community for for years like since i was little mm -hmm. and yet it hosts a lot of there's a lot of folks that go there and we're merging it with the human rights youth here awards which is going to bring for the most part groups of people who don't usually associate together right but that's a great time like we're opening it up to the different departments to come in and to talk about what goes on in town and and so it, you just it's just like the I always get concerned because I'm like, it's great that we have really engaging things on the website, but who's look? the question is who's looking at the website, right? So mm -hmm, really. that's my thoughts. Um, anything else on that or should we move on to somebody volunteering to be chair of the Resident Advisory Committee? Um, and it's a really easy committee to be chair of because you just like let anybody talk whenever they want to. And you just have to <laughs> figure out an agenda and tell Angela to post it and she does everything for you. Do we have any takers amongst our giant committee of three? <laughs> and I'm fine I'm just doing it if no one else wants to do it, but. Anastasia, can we nominate? you jim <laughs> well you don't, it's, you don't have to i mean it's just it's nothing has to happen for me to be can chair, maybe, i really can am we, can we move to nominate jim pistring as the <laughs> chair of the resident advisory committee <laughs> i second that <laughs> yeah, since i already am i don't think we need a vote on it um, <laughs> You know, at some point I may just stand down and refuse, but for now I don't mind. Like I said, all I have to do is tell Angela to post things and she posts them. So it's not that hard. <laughs> just wanted to give people an opportunity to serve. <laughs> well, I just, you know, joking aside, I, I just want to say thank you publicly, Jim, for your work. Uh, I mean, you make it sound like it's super easy, but it's not. I've chaired a committee before. 
and know that it's there's still a lot of work involved, no matter how small or big it is. And you and Angela make a good team because you're able to share, you know, a lot of the responsibilities and, you know, and, and uh, communicate with us well. But I do appreciate your service and, you know, and hope you know that. Thank you. I totally agree with everything Anastasia said. And I really appreciate Jen and, and Angela, too. You guys are unbelievable. Oh, thanks. And Jim, this is your like your civic engagement. So we're yeah, know, it's a <laughs> permanent chair of the resident. <laughs> he can't lose this position no matter how hard he tries. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do have um, public comment, and I believe Alana is still here and listening. And can Alana speak or did we, Angela, do you have to turn that on or can Alana just speak? So I think if she'd like to make public comment, it'd be great to see um, Alana raise a hand. I didn't mean to assume your pronouns. So Alana, if you'd yeah. like to, there we go. Ah. So now I will um, allow to talk. All right. And ask you to unmute, please. Hi, um, I have to attend community meetings for class. Um, my professor, Molly Mead, wants um, us to get really engaged oh. in the community, and I thought this one seemed really interesting and fun. Um, yeah, thank you guys for having me here. I don't really have any actual comments. I just have, yeah, thank you for letting me uh, sit in. Well, it's pretty exciting right. for us to get somebody from the community to this committee, so <laughs> we love it. <laughs> You guys should talk to, um, I'm at Amherst College, but Molly Mead is like very involved. She has a class called Active mm -hmm. Citizenship. So she's been sending us to community meetings like weekly. I think we have to switch it up sometimes. Um, but all right, this is my first, this one. I went to Michelle Miller's, um, the reparations one, and then town council and then the finance committee. But yeah, she really wants engagement. Um, so yeah, we've been. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. I spoke at Molly Mead's class last year about civic engagement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's sweet. She just had um, Jill speak. Oh. Um, anything else before we adjourn? I, I, it's not related to this. I want to Anastasia to talk with you soon about something related to the school campaign. I'm just saying that it's not related to this okay. meeting. So I just give just, you a call. Just a reminder with the open meeting law, if any two of us get together, we're not allowed to talk about RAC. We can still we can still talk to each other, but we can't talk about the workings of this committee. Thank you. Who is a majority? It's a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in that Thank case, um, I'd make a motion. Wait, Angela, yes. Sorry, one last thing. So I would. I would ask if it's amenable to everybody that we continue the conversation about um, the form that we use for um, this intake. And one of the things that we're running into over and over again is the pronoun piece. Um, we don't ask people to identify or we don't mandate for people to identify how they would like to be addressed. And it makes it really difficult when we're writing the um, appointment letters because we want to be um, honorific in the tone, right? Because we're appointing people to serve and they have to come in and get sworn into service. But if we could, as a group, kind of brainstorm a good way to get people to at least um, share their preferred pronouns, that would help us keep that that okay. correct tone in those appointment letters and certificates. So uh -huh. I would love for it to continue to be a topic for us if that's okay with everyone. Yeah. I mean, at the very yeah. least, you could add it to the optional information section of the form. Because mm -hmm. right now you've got age, gender, I'm cheating and looking at it, I don't have it memorized. Um, racial, ethnic background, languages, more information, but you could have preferred pronouns, just throw mm -hmm. it in there. That way people might be less insulted if you guess wrong, if they haven't put anything. And also, also there's a way of asking it that sounds respectful, like we want to address you the way you want to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not it's not prying because they can choose not to share it for some reason they don't want to yeah. right yeah 
Great. But, yeah, thank you. We can ponder that. Thanks okay. for having me. Oh, thank you for pleasure. coming. Gosh. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. You could, you could have I said have no, Jennifer. and that would have been awkward. Yeah. Oh, I could never. <laughs> I could never. Look at these faces. Who could say no yeah. to that? <laughs> Okay, so in that case, I move that we adjourn this meeting. Well, actually, before we do that, um, should we talk about when we want to meet next, a vague time frame in two months or something like, or maybe in three months after the June craziness? I'm assuming there's going to be something of a June craziness of interviews. So should I try and, I mean, maybe I'll wait another month to do it, but maybe try and set up a doodle poll for a July meeting. And it's tricky because people are coming and going, but we should be able to find something. That sound good? That sounds good. I, I just want to say I will be away uh, for a portion of July. So, um, you know, if, if it's possible to continue remote participation, then I can join from pretty much anywhere. Yeah, and I think I think that that's my intention anyway. I think that's Absolutely. what we would do. Thank you. Okay, in that case, I I will wait another month, sometime in May, which is really soon. I'll send out a doodle poll for a July meeting, and I move that we adjourn. Second. I see a second. All those in favor can give me a thumbs up, second. and I see it's unanimous. So we are <laughs> adjourning. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks so much, Angela. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>